Welcome to episode one of Blasphemous Sodcast. Whether you are listening at the beginning of our journey or you are from the future and are just starting from the beginning, we hope you enjoy our first attempt at podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> We're your hosts. I am Stevie. <laughs> I have read the Bible uh, four or five times with my family all the way through. And I was raised outside of organized religion, kind of a home church setting with a few other families and uh, family friends. And I am Hannah. I have never read the Bible. I don't <laughs> think I have even ever read a section of the Bible that was like actually from the Bible and wasn't just paraphrased on like Tumblr or something. I mean, I have at best a pop culture understanding of the Bible. I, I wasn't raised in any specific religion or spirituality. You know, my parents refer to themselves as... Recovering Catholics. Yes. <laughs> um, but I am a self-proclaimed, non-practicing uh, pagan, <laughs> specifically uh, Celtic traditionalism. We are also married <laughs> and doing pretty well despite these different beliefs. We found ourselves having these really long, engaging discussions about the Bible because... Because I would erroneously reference the Bible and Stevie would go, well, actually... Well, actually... Um, no, I would tell her what the Bible actually said and then we would laugh and dissect some of the weirder bits, but it was always very respectful. I was never trying to convert her and I never felt judged for believing in something that she didn't. And we decided to do this podcast because one day we just thought, this is really interesting. And there aren't a lot of couples that that I know of that have such different, like, higher power beliefs, um, but can still talk about, you know, the Bible this way. And I see the New and Old Testament, or I, I like to refer to them as the Testament and the sequel, <laughs> as a book of myths and parables, you know, just um, metaphorical stories that help us to kind of view the world and our place in it and, you know, how to find our purpose. And to me, the New Testament uh, was kind of, specifically the New Testament was the foundation of a lot of my upbringing. And I see the Gospels of Jesus to be where reality and myth intersect in history, while the Old Testament I take with more than a few grains of salt because while there are a lot of historical facts that can be verified some of the stories don't really pull my faith quite as strongly as the story and message of jesus so each episode stevie will tell me a story from the bible and while we discuss and debate we will try our best to be respectful around the jokes but you know remember the podcast is called blasphemous mm -hmm. so we will definitely be you know taking the bible down from its sacred pedestal where you know it can't be questioned yep and this week <laughs> this week we will be talking about david and bathsheba uh, Hannah, what do you already know about this story absolutely nothing <laughs> nothing at all <laughs> i have never heard um of either of them prior to this um what i do know though you mentioned something the other day that the um song hallelujah yes is um kind of based on this story the whole moonlight bath from yes. the roof or whatever mm -hmm. and i said oh shrek yes so <laughs> that's what i know about the story <laughs> i love you so much um yeah no so um real quick hallelujah by leonard cohen uh, great song mixes up the maybe not mixes up but just combines Com yeah combines I mean that's uh, oh well, well that's kind of that's what, how I meant by oh, okay. mix up I meant like mix up like you if you're making a cake no <laughs> like stirring it up yeah I'm stirring it up he's combining like Samson say, you know like Leonard Cohen he knows what he's doing when he's making a song exactly this wasn't he's, a mistake yeah I'm sure it was not a mistake but he uh, yeah so that song's like David Bathsheba also Samson and Delilah and other stories um, we should do like a, a close reading of, of Hallelujah. Of Hallelujah. Yeah, we should. Like, That's a great you know, idea. Like in my college English class, we had to do line by line, word by word, you know, comma by comma, what all the poems meant mm -hmm. and what they were really trying to say. We should do that with Hallelujah. That'd be fun. That's a great idea. Yeah. So our story starts off. Wait, is this in the New Testament or the Old Testament? This is in the Old Testament okay. or the Testament. The Testament, the original. And is this one of those verifiable historical facts that you've been talking about? Uh, most likely, yeah. Most likely. At least the, uh, the wars that are uh, surrounding the story are verifiable. So these are real people. Yes, these are real people that okay. we are talking about. Uh, this is King David 
of Israel. King David. King David, the same David who killed Goliath and... Whoa, spoiler! Yeah, spoiler, sorry. Whoa, we'll talk about that in another episode. Um, oh, he's the David of David and Goliath. He's the David of David and Goliath, yes. Right. King. He is now king of Israel. He wasn't king then. No, he was just a, a shepherd boy. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Uh, a shepherd boy with a ruddy what a rise. Right? Yeah, a real quick rise, too. Um, okay, all right. So, oh, yeah. So, he's um, King David now. It's King David, and our story picks up in springtime. And it's uh, it's so crazy because today is the spring equinox. It is. That's right. That we're um, recording this anyway. Yeah, so. right. How about that? We didn't even plan that. Yeah. How about that? We did a good job. Synchronicity. That's not Synchron- synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> it is if we want it to be. That's true. If- yeah, right. It can be. Um, so it's springtime, and the Bible says that that is around the time when most kings go to war in Israel, apparently. So it's wartime. They're... That off. makes sense. You're all like, you know, cooped up from the winter. That's right. Ready I mean, to go fight some stuff. Yeah, I don't know what the winters were like there, but I mean, I don't know if anyone could hear that little hiss, but I just opened a Red Bull. Ooh, satisfying. Anyways, <laughs> I hope that picked don't up. Don't spill it. I hope that picked up on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's springtime. It's springtime. So Israel's going to go try and fight the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, who is just, I I, I can't remember who they are right now, but they're enemies. It's typically custom for the king of Israel to go to the battlefield and fight with his troops. And King David is known as a a mighty warrior. This man is not like a a stranger to killing people with his own two hands. Um, But he decides that he just doesn't feel like it, and he's going to stay back at home in Jerusalem. He's going to stay at the the palace. He's had his... Wait, is this like the first day of battle that he decides he's not interested? No, he probably planned it. I, I would assume. It doesn't say exactly, but I would assume he's like... I mean, like, has this battle been going on, and he's been fighting, and just like just today he decides he doesn't want to go out? Or is it like the this is the first day of battle, and he has decided he doesn't want to go out? I think it's more like they've been they were they were planning their like course of action and David's like I'm gonna sit this one out, fellas. You guys, I trust you guys. Go kick some kick some ass for me. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that that's what what it sounds like. But again, not very typical. Hmm. He should be it. It kind of the wording A little sus. Exactly, the wording uh, implies to me that like he probably should have been out there with his men. Gotcha. Um, so anyways, he's at home chilling, and one night, he's out <laughs> on his balcony. He's chilling like a villain. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, and one night, he's out on his balcony, and he looks down on the city, and he sees a woman taking a bath on her rooftop. As you do. As you do. Does she just, like, haul her bathtub up to the roof? Yeah. <laughs> like, these damn kids, I can't get a minute without them. <laughs> Well, she doesn't have any kids yet. Oh, so... Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't know that yet, Who though. knows who she's avoiding That's then. true. She's just a woman, at th- a random woman at this point. Well, I understand from <laughs> King David's perspective, she's just a random woman, but from her perspective, you know, she has a whole life story already. This is true. So this I'm is true. So I'm just trying to dig into what her life story is at this point. Ah, fun fact about her life story. Her dad is friends with David, apparently. I read that once um, on some article called... Can't remember who wrote it, but it's called The Nine Important Men in the Life of Bathsheba. While I was researching this episode, <laughs> apparently she might have actually, as a little girl, been guests at the royal court. Oh, gross. Yeah. Yeah. Long, yeah. There's a lot of that in the Bible. Um, so, uh, so he sees her bathing, and he's like... On the roof. That's right. <laughs> and he's just like... Sm- he is smitten. He's like... Damn, she's sexy. Yeah. Um, I gotta find Red out. Naked ladies. Yeah, yeah right. Like, like who? He's getting. He's having a good time watching the show. Yeah. Anyway, so he. <laughs> like I knew I was not supposed to go this today. Uh, I made the right decision. Yeah. Instead of killing people, I get to. So basically, <laughs> the moral of this whole story is: if you're going to bathe on a rooftop, make sure that your rooftop is the highest of all the rooftops. Of all the rooftops, that's right. <laughs> that, that's the quick moral of this story. <laughs> we learn it real close in the beginning. Yes. That's nice. That's a, an efficient parable to learn the moral right in the beginning. Arguably, one of the most pragmatic lessons of the Bible. Lessons. Um, <laughs> lessons of the Bible. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right, oh man. So he's like. Sweet lady bathing. Yeah, that's some such a sweet piece. I need to to do the smash, and um, so he inquires about her, 
And uh, yeah, he <laughs> how just, do you inquire about? Because he's the king. <laughs> no, I just mean like, how do you bring that up? So, uh, how many? You know, this is a lady bathing on the rooftop. Who's that? Yeah, yeah. Who, everybody know her. Did he just like bring his advisors over <laughs> and was like, "Look at that, that lady. Um, it who is who is her?" <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd like I'd like to think that's exactly what happened. He's right. just like, you know, uh, Jedediah, get in here. I don't know if he, Jedediah, come here. And his servants <laughs> like, "Yes, your Majesty." And he's like, "Look at that." And he just points, and there's some. It's like, "Look at that naked lady. Who's she?" And the servants like, "Oh, that's uh, that's obviously Bathsheba. She's the." Can you tell her? Bathsheba's Bath taking Sheba. a bath. It's That's in what her name. she does. Yeah, she's like you could tell just by 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 the way she is. It's Bathsheba. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> finds out that it's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, um, mm. who we'll find out is actually a pretty pretty stand up dude. Aww. Um So. That's nice for Bathsheba. It is. She has a nice husband. You know, she's got a nice home life. It it seems it's not life is going well for her. But then David swoops in, and is like, "Bring her to the palace. It's I need to talk to her." Actually, never a good idea to catch the eye of a king. No, your life is usually going just smoothly enough. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need the king. No, you don't need the king. You never need the king. You never need the king. That's what the fairy tales really tell you mm-hmm. is that you never actually need the king. No, no, yeah. No, <laughs> it, it it your life will be much better and less complicated without it. Um yeah, so he brings her to the palace and sleeps with her. You just just bam, wham bam, thank you, ma'am. Ah, cuz he's the king. He's he the can king. Say, you do this, and she goes, "Okay, I guess." I'm most likely. It's kind. It's usually portrayed. Well, I guess I'm oh. saying, is there was there a seduction, or was it like, this is your command? And she said, "Okay." You know, it's not super clear. Um, it just kind of says, like, you know, he summoned her to the palace, and they slept together. It says in the Bible that they did the dirty. They did the dirty. Wow. They they yeah they lay with each other as it as it is. Oh. Uh, yes, if you ever see. In the Bible, if you ever see it, when it says, uh, and they lay together, it means that they they did the fun stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, I apologize. So, they did the fun stuff. They did the fun stuff. And um, it's always usually portrayed, too, like in movies, that it's like this hot, passionate romance that, like, you know, David summoned her on, you know, obviously David wants to sleep with her, but she, you know, because David was, like, a good-looking dude. Like, he was a very eligible bachelor even, like, before he was the king. So he's not married at this point? No, he's got many wives. Ah. Yes. And and each one of them, again, and actually, like, yeah. If, like, many wives or a wife and some concubines? No, wives. Mm. Multiple wives. Um mm. Because it was totally cool then. It's good to be it's king. It's what all the kids were doing. Um, all the kings, anyways, yeah. Yeah. It's good to be the king. Have you seen uh, the History of the World Part One? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> and uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, uh, it's always portrayed as like this hot, passionate romance, uh, and it's Wait, a lot of where? fun in movies. Okay. So, well, they've made a movie about it, a romance. <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's <laughs> well, portraying? Who's portraying this? <laughs> Just some like random. <laughs> Random. This is like your Bible study, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like those. Well, yeah. I'm sh- I'm sure. So there used to be these old Hanna Barbera cartoons, produced cartoons about Bible stories. Um, like a Veggie Tales kind of thing. Yeah, but actually uh, a lot gorier. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for kids. I can't remember what they were called now, but it was these three explorers and like from from modern times and they find like some kind of ancient like spell or time machine or something and it sends them back to to bible times and then they have these adventures and they're trying to find their way back like they keep finding like portals forward but they experience like these events from the bible mm-hmm. it was actually a lot of fun i remember the main character they were uh, margo derrick and moki mm. yeah so those are the three characters i hope that i can find out what that were- that show was called sounds like that book series the magical tree house or whatever it is like that actually but with the bible well yeah okay yeah <laughs> I don't remember all the books. Maybe they went back into the time of a Bible. Oh, maybe they did. Maybe they did. Maybe they I did. just meant like the magical spell was the treehouse. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's probably like that. So, anyways. So, anyways. Veggie Tales always portrays this as a very passionate <laughs> love scene. <laughs> yes. Is what we just Actually, <laughs> a second. Veggie Tales 
did make an episode based on this, but instead of <laughs> instead of a wife, instead of a woman, it's a rubber ducky. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That he sees bathing. He sees. <laughs> Hang on a second. This is okay. Okay. King George and the Rubber Ducky. It's called King George and the Rubber Ducky, and King George. King George is the name of the king in this one. Played by. How come VeggieTales is not going for accuracy? Because they can't. Because they can't. It's a children's. But they could at least go with the right king. Well, because they've already done things with King David. They did things with. King David did a lot of things. Yeah, but like. Did they go? You know, like you know. They did Dave. Mister. Peter and the Red Sea, you know, Mr. they let <laughs> Moses do all of his things, I'm betting. How rude. <laughs> I have to cut that Sorry. out. Sorry, <laughs> oh, no, I just started choking on myself, but, um, yeah, no, um. All right, so whatever. So, they King did King George, George and, and the Rubber Ducky. Okay. British, all of a sudden. So. There's no George in the Bible. No, there is no George in the Bible. I know that much. Yes, the, you are correct. Um, actually, let's come back to King George and the Ducky because it's going to be a lot funnier after I finish the story. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. So, anyways, passionate love affair. Passionate love, love affair. They have a great time. Just this one night. Just this one night, uh, apparently. And then um, she goes home and then. To bathe again. Yeah, probably because she probably smells like, you know... King George. King George. Slash David. <laughs> slash David. George David. It's confusing. Yeah. Um, and so... And then, like, a little while later, she finds out she's pregnant. And oh, King David is like, no. shit. Like, uh-oh. This is not good for me, obviously. Because even, even the king is not supposed to do things like that. In Like, if, if it's someone else... Like, he can take as many wives as he wants, but he's not supposed to take... Under, you know, uh, Hebrew law, you're not supposed to take another person's wife. And does he... Okay. Yeah. So, they did it just the once, because he was like, I need... I need... I need. <laughs> and then she got pregnant. Yep. And then... Okay. Yeah, so what he does is he concocts a plan... And he summons Uriah the Hittite, who's fighting for him. Her husband. Her husband. Uh, he summons her husband, who is fighting for King David currently on the battlefield, mm -hmm. to him in the palace in Jerusalem to essentially just, under the pretense of wanting a report on the war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so Uriah, being the cool dude he is, uh, you know, glad, glad, gladfully, he gladfully comes to the king. <laughs> I don't know. I'm losing just my mind. Discovering new words every day. <laughs> Yeah, uh, pardon my aneurysm. Um, <laughs> so he, um, he, so he comes to the palace, and uh, David's like, "Cool, cool. Tell me how the war is going." And your eye is like, "It's going just fine. You know, it's a war. Kind of mm -hmm. sucks, but whatever." And King David's like, "Cool story, bro. Uh, you have done your like. You're you're a great person. Why don't you go home and take a load off?" And really what he's trying to do is he wants him to go home and sleep with his wife. So is he not, has he been like away from home for this whole time? Yes. Okay. He's been living in tents on the battlefield. I see. Yeah. Cause so the battle is far away. It's far away. Yeah. It's not, it's not in Jerusalem. No. Okay. So that's the issue. Yes. He is not, the husband is not around. Okay. So there's no way that he would. He has no idea what's father. going on. Yeah. No. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, no, there's no way he could have been the father. Um, but David wants to, you know... So when he says, take a load off, he really means... Yeah, take a load okay. off. Okay. Um, and so... But Uriah, being the cool dude he is, um, he's like, you know, my comrades in, and my generals are, you know, they're all on the battlefield. They don't get to, you know, go home and sleep with their wives, so I'm not going to do that either, because it's not fair. Doesn't sound like a cool guy. Go home and your wife has needs. Yeah, you know that you're no, right. she doesn't I, because she got taken true. care of by she, King, King David, but you know. <laughs> you can say King George. I was. You ruined me. I'm sorry. Veggie tales. No, it's true. Um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, he, it, I guess it depends on who, like, I guess he's just, a, you know, he's a soldier first and foremost, I guess, which is poor Bathsheba. You know what? Maybe my opinion of Uriah has, has changed a little bit now. <laughs> He's one of those dudes that's like, you know, duty and honor above all. Insufferable. Oh. <laughs> okay, maybe not insufferable. But, well, so what he ends up sleeping in the servants' corp quarters. He doesn't even go home. Doesn't even go home. He just, because he doesn't, because he doesn't think he's supposed to. Like, he thinks it would be wrong to do that. And so he doesn't. Ugh. And David has the same reaction. He is like, <laughs> Uriah. Like, he's he like. He has the same reaction. Yeah, he's like, he, he's like, Uriah, you just. Like, it was a long way. Like, you just come from a long journey. Go 
home. Like, and, yeah, come on, think of your wife. Yeah, and then your eyes like, no, no, I can't do it. It wouldn't wouldn't be the right thing to do. And David's like, okay, fine, whatever. So just stay in Jerusalem for the day and then head back to the battlefield. Um, and your eyes like, okay, cool. And so that night, though, David's like, surprise, here's a feast for you, and he gets him really drunk again, hoping that, and he, like again. You know, go home, go home, mm-hmm. Mr. Drunk Man. And then, but he still doesn't. He even drunk, he sticks to his, his, his. Maybe he doesn't like Bathsheba. You know, that's, I hadn't thought about that until just now. Mm, maybe he, you know, likes being with his maybe, comrades. With his comrades. More. Maybe he really likes General Joab. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. General Joab. Yeah. That, that's the, yeah, that's the commander of the army. But, um, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe who there's knows? a reason Bathsheba was like, yes, yes, yes David. I will have sex with you, King David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, I've, she's, uh, she's up there bathing on the roof as like advertisement. Oh, someone, please. <laughs> someone, please. Please. <laughs> What's the what's the term from Game of Thrones? Uh, oh, my husband is a sword swallower. Oh my! Remember that from no. Game of Thrones? Mm-mm. Oh, it's like and your nephew. Oh, a sword swallower through and through. Do you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my great. god! Yeah. Okay, so anyways, drunk, still not gonna go home. Mm-hmm. Does Bathsheba know he's in the city? You know, I don't know. Okay. It doesn't say. Okay. I, I'd like to think that she doesn't. How funny would it be if she's just like at home ready to seduce her husband? Know, yeah. Because she knows that she needs to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, or I can also totally see King David, you know, being a man, not cluing her in on this at all. It's very possible. And so, you know, she might not even be home when he goes home to sleep with her. I know, right? You know? She might be off doing errands. She might yeah. not, you know. Who knows? Maybe King David's not the only person she's sleeping with. It's very possible. Who knows? Yeah, we need to know more about this Bathsheba. <laughs> we do. Anyways. Anyways, so... Um, he won't go home. She, he won't go home, so David's like, all right, you know what? I'm about to get in real big trouble, so screw it. And he sends a letter to Joab. You know, real quick, this is kind of nice that King David is taking such a responsibility for this. You know, it's not like this baby's going to be bored and it's going to have, like, uh-huh. his name, like, stamped across his forehead. You know what I mean? Like, really, when it comes down to it, it's going to be who is Bathsheba sleeping with on the side while her husband is out. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, it's true. I would see culturally, like, and I don't know about culture, but just like historically and even in today's society where the blame would be on her. Oh, definitely. And, you know what I mean? The guy's just like, I'm Audi, you know? It probably would have been the same then, too. But it's very interesting that in this story, whether this is how it happened or not, that it is kind of on King David mm-hmm. to rectify this situation. He is, he is, to his credit, he is trying so hard to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. He right, is. So he writes a letter to King. To, to Commander Joab. Commander Joab. Commander Joab, who uh, we'll find out in later stories, Joab is a troublemaker. Oh, no. So, so he already doesn't, like, him and David have a rocky relationship. So he sends a message to Joab saying, I want you to put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle and have the rest of the troops withdraw. So he's just by himself? So he gets killed. Wait. So he's just like, send Uriah. To the front and have everyone else go away. Uh, essentially, uh, it, 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 if I remember it correctly, it might. I think it depends on the translation. I think but it I, could have been a little bit more subtle with trying to get him killed. Basically, yeah, he could have been. But you know, Joab and Joab's essentially like weird request, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And so, and so he does, and you know, Joab. I mean, uh, hit Uriah the Hittite uh, is killed. Oh, yeah, no. he dies. Should have um, just gone to sleep with your wife. Should have gone to sleep with your wife. Second Uriah. moral of the story: sex when a king or death. Tells you to sleep with your wife. <laughs> you sleep, sleep with, with your wife. wife. <laughs> well, you have the royal mandate to make the whoopee. You make the whoopee. There you go. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it was a really bad battle. Like, like uh, they had a lot of. Well, yeah, they called everyone else away. No, yeah, but I mean, even after that, like, lot they had a lot of losses besides mm-hmm. Uriah, mm-hmm. and so um, Joab. It's like kind of like uh, not feeling too good about that. So he tells the messenger, when you tell King David that like, you know, we lost a ton of people, just like throw in that Uriah is dead. That'll hopefully make him not so angry about it. And so because Joab kind of totally read that he wanted him. He, dead. Exactly. Okay. He knew what was going on. Uh, and so um, <laughs> and so the messenger goes 
and he's telling King David the bad news. And then at the end, he slips in like, you know, like, on Uriah the Hittite is dead as well. And then David is, Woo-hoo! yeah, David is like, <laughs> he has this whole, like, I love the, it's worded in a way where it's like, essentially like the sword devour, David, David's like the sword devoureth one as well as another. He's just like, war is hell. Things mm-hmm. happen. Mm-hmm. Tell Joab not to worry too much about it. Yeah. You know, it's. It's all good. It is what it is. Is what it is. <laughs> and uh, inside, he's like, yes, yes, it's yes, like, yes, oh, yes. it worked. I'm off the hook. And then, so Bathsheba mourns for the appropriate amount of time because, like, in Jewish culture, there's the you know, you you mourn for a certain amount of time, and then you start looking for a new husband ah. or wife, depending on you know who you are. And um, and then as the, soon as the mourning time is done. David marries her. Oh, look at that stand-up guy. Yeah, so, like, David was never not going to take care no, of this. No, this is terrible. They it, cheated on their husband. And then murdered him, yes. Yes. Yeah. None of, yeah. But still, stand-up guy. Yeah, like, he's not, like, he... He's not leaving her out there to flounder. No, he's not going to, like, let her be destitute. Um. So, then she has the baby, and things are... David's like, okay, whoo, like, dodged a big bullet there. But then... Poor Uriah. <laughs> poor Uriah. Oh, Uriah. He just wanted to be a good soldier and hang out with his bros. So that the end of the story? No. So um, <clears throat> Nathan shows up. Now Nathan was a prophet, and uh, oh no, oh no, yeah, it's never good when a prophet, when God sends a prophet to visit a king, it's never good. Oh, he was a real prophet. He was okay. he was a prophet, prophet. God sent him. Like the David didn't ask this guy to show up. He just shows up. But he was known. He was like I. If I remember correctly, and I might be wrong about this, I think he was like a, a student of Samuel, the prophet who anointed and selected David to be the next king of Israel uh, okay. after Saul was, uh, you know, mm-hmm. did bad things. And so... Prophet Nathan. Prophet Nathan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds really funny. I know, right? Because I don't see Nathan today as being, you know, a very... I strange don't name. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like Mark. Mark is a Hebrew name, oh, but yes. yeah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> Michael, Matthew, yeah, all those names. Those are, anyways, yeah. Matthew, I don't know. I can see Matthew. Yeah. But just Nathan. I think because I think of Nathan's hot dogs. Yeah. Maybe Ooh. that's why. Yeah. Delicious. Delicious. But not really prophetic. No, not very prophetic, but boy, they're good. Okay, so he pops up. He pops with up. With his hot dog cart. With his hot dog cart, right into the royal palace. He gives King David his hot dog <laughs> and that says. That didn't happen. And no, it didn't happen. You're right. That didn't happen. I lied. Um, no, he uh, he essentially is like, David, I have a story for you. There was once a rich man, and this man had... Once I was a rich, rich man. man. <laughs> dooby 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 Yes, that... <laughs> I love you so much. Oh, yes. Feather on the roof. If you've never seen it, please see it. It's amazing. It and, is amazing. Yeah. Um, so... You know, so once and that's upon, not how the song goes. No, that's not how the song goes. Um, no, so Nathan is like, King David, I have a story for you. Once upon a time, there was a very, very rich man, and he had, like, tons of sheep and livestock and everything you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Had so many things and, and, you know, wanted for nothing. And there was also a very poor man, and this poor man had almost nothing in his life. He was essentially a homeless dude, but he had a lamb. And he loved that lamb like it was part of his family. He fed it out of his hands. Oh, no. Do you see where this is going? So, yes, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Oh, you understand? Happening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he he fed it out of his hand. He let it like sit with his family at mealtime. It was like And then the, the rich man fucked the, his lamb. <laughs> <laughs> No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought this was gonna be like the parable, you know, compared to like. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. Saw the lamb taking a bath, and well, then you know, was like, "I must have this." Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be so much funnier when I tell you about King George and the ducky. <laughs> So, okay, so... Anyways, he loved his lamb. He loved his lamb. <laughs> I had that thought when I was rereading the story, too, which is why it's so funny. So, so he loved that lamb, the poor man did. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then one day the rich man had a traveler from a faraway land that the rich man desperately needed to impress 
and wine and dine. So instead of taking one of his own animals to prepare for dinner for this traveler, he steals the poor man's lamb and serves that up to him. And King David... Wait, he serves it to the poor man? No, he serves it to the, the, the wealthy man, steals the poor man's lamb and serves it to his guest. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. And King David is livid after he hears this because david at this point does not know that this story is about him <laughs> he's, a little dumb. he's he's like he thinks he's listening to a true because nathan like poses it as a true story and Aww. he's like who is this man he must pay like he will die he like D- david's like we this man will be put to death but not before he has paid back that poor man four times what he owes wow and he then, really just like sticking his foot in it mm-hmm. isn't he? And then Nathan's like, "You are the man." He's like, ha! <laughs> I love to, yeah, right? I love to imagine the big, the pointing finger, like, "It's you, you are that man." You are the rich man. And David's like, "I didn't steal anyone's lamb. What are you talking about?" Oh, yeah. Then he's like, "Oh, wait a minute." And then yeah, he's like, "You have many wives." And it's like Nathan's like, "Thus saith the Lord," which is what prophets always say. In Thus, the Old saith, Testament. The Thus Lord. saith the Lord. That's how you know it really came from God. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, and that's how um, that's how it always gets their attention. And he's like, I. You know, Thus saith the who. Thus saith the who. Thus the saith Lord. the Lord. Oh, no. And he says, Thus saith the Lord. I have given you many wives. I have made you king of Israel. I would have given you more. So what the hell, David? Why did you do this? Like you didn't need to do this. And he says, because of this. The sword will never depart from your house. He's always going to have, like, essentially, David is always going to have violent conflict within his family because of this. Like, it does, and, uh, and, and, not only that, God's going to, at some point in the future, take David's wives and give them to his quote-unquote neighbor, and his quote-unquote neighbor will sleep with his wives in front of all of Israel, like, Literally in front of all These of his These poor real. wives, just pawns and yeah. God's little revenge story. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's very interesting, though, because it kind I mean, it's interesting proof of free will. You know, like, God provides these things for you, mm-hmm. but he's not a puppet master, you know? Yeah. Like, David still made these decisions. They were bad decisions, and he's going to face consequences for them. And, yes, God is the one kind of creating these consequences but david still had you know this free choice to yeah make he these didn't decisions, have to do that yeah. which is very i don't know i just find that very interesting because a lot of the issues i have with this idea of a god that you know moves these pieces around is that is he moving me around but this is really interesting proof that he's not he's putting things you know, mm-hmm. in you know, in place kind of thing. He's setting up a game board essentially, but you're still making your decisions. Yeah, well, and I think there's um there's th- 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 and that right there is like that that debate has been going on in the Christian community community for like since since Jesus is like you know do we have free will? Is everything predetermined? I think it's both. Like personally, like it, it, there's a, there's a weird gray area where it, they both they both are possible. I feel, mm-hmm. but that's um you know. I just mean in this particular story, exactly, yeah. It yeah it it says if it's evidence for free will. Yeah, the idea that you know we do make our own choices and uh, good or bad live with the consequences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, and so yeah, so oh, and w- the reason I said quote unquote neighbor is because do you mind if I give like a huge spoiler for uh, a possible later episode? No, not at all. Okay, uh, so that neighbor will end up being his own son, Absalom, who tries to usurp him at one point, and mm. it, as a show of defiance against his father, sleeps with all of his de- his his stepmoms essentially, and maybe even his own mother. I don't remember who his own mother was. It might have actually been, probably not actually, because Bathsheba I don't think got slept with in that situation because she fled with David. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I can't remember exactly, but anyway, so th- this is like a prophecy about what ends up happening again in his own family Mm -hmm. and 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 after this like the whole like lineage of david is fraught with like you know people trying to take the throne from each other and like i think it's what i think it's what ends up leading to israel being split into israel to the north and judea to the south and before it it's kind of a peaceful i guess not peaceful because he's 
at battle when this happens, but like his own home is peaceful. Exactly. There's a lot less conflict within the actual royal household of Israel. People aren't trying to overthrow, take his, him. overthrow him. Yeah, because for the most part, David's a very good king. Um, you know, to his people. Interesting. Yeah, and so um, and so David it feels real bad. Like he immediately is like repentant. He's like, "No, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry." And and Nathan's like, "It's okay. Like you know, you, these are the consequences, but God's not going to kill you. Like you know, that's these are the consequences. But the final punishment of this is the baby that you guys had is going to die. Oh, yeah, like not make it. it's not going to make it again. A pawn. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the baby didn't do anything wrong. Nope. Yeah. And I mean, and that's, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those, one of those things with the old Testament that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, just saying. No. Yeah, exactly. The baby. Pointing it out. Say what? Just pointing it out. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> poor little baby. Poor little, poor little baby. Yeah. So immediately. So it just, it, it just doesn't get it, born. It, oh no. It's, it's born already. Oh, it's already born. It's born already, it's but born. it gets really sick. Yeah, I and mean, it's like an infant still. Like the baby's like you know, so it's it's you know, it, to an outside observer, it actually wouldn't have been like a like yeah, it's a, not a suspicious death. No, the baby's died. Yeah, and so the whole time David is that the baby is sick. David is fasting and praying, and he's not wearing his royal clothes. He's covered himself in sackcloth and ash, which is mourning and you know, uh, weeping garments. Even Hebrew. though he already knows that God's made up his mind, he he knows that God's made up his mind, but he's he he's trying to he doesn't like in his in his like emotional side he wants to know if God's going to have mercy or not. Uh, so he's he's essentially like because the purpose. So fasting is interesting because in in especially in the modern Christian community, people look at fasting as a way of trying to get God to do things for you, which is not the purpose of fasting in in the Bible. The purpose of fasting in the Bible is essentially to know and come to peace with mm. the will of God. It's, 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 you know... Because fasting does have, like, a clarifying effect it on does. your own mind. It's true, yeah. It, without it being spiritual at all, it's just yep. a kind of clears the fog of digestion away from it's you. It's true, yeah. So I can totally see how people would see that as spiritual mm -hmm. before you had kind of science to explain why that happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. But yeah, so he's fasting. And uh, the thing that like in the modern Christian church is that people use fasting now as like, uh, I'm going to trick God to give me what I want by not eating. And it's like, uh, that's how they like. Like a hunger strike? Yeah, exactly. It's like that. Like I've had, <laughs> and God just up there like, listen, I know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And I, I have so many times been asked, like, well, let me know if you need fasting and prayer for that. What an interesting <laughs> like relationship with God. You know, I guess in general, not just with you know Christianity and, but I guess in all spiritualities, you know, pagan spiritualities included, I've always found, you know, um, prayers to higher beings mm -hmm. to be um, a very interesting relationship with your higher being. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I see, you know, because I also am interested in witchcraft, you know, not Wiccan, but like a cottage witch or like a kitchen witch kind yeah. of thing. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in that kind of stuff. And when I see... Um, you know, spells, you know, like um, more as just like a meditation of, you know, what you want to see in the universe kind of thing. The idea of a, of a spell just being like a meditation on what you want and trying to not necessarily draw the end result to you, but open your mind up to being able to see the opportunities to get that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so I guess I feel like you know, in some instances, prayer can be that, you know, um, compared to that yeah. kind of thing. But prayer as a way to, you know, convince God that you ac you actually know better than him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or um, as like transactional or even forcing his hand just seems to be a very, I'm just going to say, interesting relationship with your higher being. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems... Seems very strange to me. It, I agree, actually. It is. I mean, and for myself, when I pray, I'm usually just like, when I pray 
about things, it's, you know, one, it's usually in my head. I don't like, you know, do the traditional bow my head Mm -hmm. and thing. It's more of a asking, asking for uh, just peace about things Mm -hmm. and, and, and just that, like whatever happens that I'll be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And that's for me, that's kind of so, but I agree. Like I, I I tend to look at the transactional Mm -hmm. way of praying as a very, like, it's not how I was raised. So Mm -hmm. it's very like when I see it, it it, it is very like an interesting, like, yeah. And as someone who's never, you know, is not Christian and mm -hmm. doesn't believe in God and stuff like it, when people used to say, Oh, I'll pray for you or whatever. I used to get very defensive about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I see it, I think it's kind of sweet. You know, I, when people are being, you know, mean about it, yeah, you can preachy, tell, yeah. like, oh, I'm going to pray for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there are some people that, you know, they say they're going to pray for you. you. They know you're going through a hard time or you just lost someone or something mm-hmm. and they're praying for you. And I've come to find that to be very comforting because I see that. You know, I'm not expecting, you know, them to convince <laughs> God to change my life in any way. But it's it's nice to know that you're in someone's thoughts. You yeah. know what I mean? That there is someone else in this world that cares enough about you and your life mm-hmm. to, you know, wish the best for you. And to kind of, I don't know, put in a good word for you. Kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. very comforting to kind of know that you're not alone in this moment in this universe mm-hmm. you know so I've, I've i've become less defensive about that yeah well and that's um uh our good friend ricky who we used to do theater with i was talking to him about prayer once and he he believes that prayer totally works not because he believes in god but because he believes in the Jungian collective unconscious mm. so i so and, and i think there might be a little uh, there is an aspect of that when it comes to prayer definitely like can you I, elaborate on what he means by that? oh just that like if you have enough people praying for something it'll cause the a co- shift a shift Interesting. yeah so you know that's um very <clears throat> cool so that's like you know yeah the effort of like one person can't lift a bus off of you know a trapped person, baby yeah but, <laughs> 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 baby i don't know bus? that's where my mind went um <laughs> Yeah, but you know, maybe a group of people could could lift it enough exactly, to, yeah. to get them out. That's very interesting. Yeah, and I don't and like and that's something like I don't have like I just know how I pray, but there might be very much something to that. Like I'm actually recently been very interested in Jung just because like I I want to read his book. Um, I think it's called Ion. It's about um, have you heard of that one Mm-mm. where he compares like Jesus certain aspects of I think I don't know if it's Jesus specifically or it might just be Christian iconography to the zodiac things mm. like uh, to astrological signs and it was these are things that were like never planned by the you know either christians or well, astrologists yes. mm-hmm. but it just matches up for some reason so I, I don't know i'm really interested in that um yeah. well that's his whole idea of the collective unconscious is that there are myths from all over the world mm-hmm. that mirror each other yeah but you can't really find the crossover of where you know one culture would have um, you know, told that myth to this other culture kind of thing. You know, there there isn't that. Um, you can't trace that. Yeah. It's just they <clears throat> both just have this idea. Yeah. And it, it can be very specific. Like, mm-hmm. I believe there's this myth um, that, you know, it, it's like someone, there's like a co- corn stalk growing or something. Yeah. And, per- and that corn stalk becomes a person or something. And it's like so, something very specific um, like that that you see in multiple yeah. cultures. Yeah. I don't know. So anyways, yeah. prayer is transaction. Yeah, wow. They got really deep for <laughs> David and Bathsheba. Um, <laughs> Thanks for following us on that team. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I had, I had a fun time with that one. Um, but yeah, so so anyways, David's fasting and praying just you know, just to basically see whether or not God will be merciful. And after, I think he does this for seven days, if I remember correctly. This is a week where the baby is sick and they don't mm-hmm. know if it's going to make it. it. It's. I mean, it might. I might be remembering that wrong. It might only be three days, but it's long enough that it's significant amount of time to Mm -hmm. be fasting and then the baby dies yes and um david doesn't know because he's been he's not in the room and his servants are terrified to tell him that the baby died because they're like he's been weeping and fasting and he's you know covered in sackcloth and ash so not necessarily terrified that he might erupt and be mean to them no but terrified that he's, he's going to be heartbroken yeah they're like because like if he's this bad now mm-hmm. how you know what's he going to be like when we tell him the baby's dead mm-hmm. and he overhears them talking oh, no. and he's like is the baby dead and they're like yeah the baby's dead and he's and he gets up and he washes himself off he goes 
to I think pretty sure it says he goes to the temple, you know, he prays and then he eats and continues on. Mm-hmm. And his servants are like, you know, whoa, like, hang on a second. Why are you so like calm about this? And he said, you know, I knew like I knew this was going to happen. Like I didn't, you know, I um, when, the, you know, it basically da- David says that like when the child was still alive, I was praying for it but it's dead and there's nothing I can do to bring it back. And he's, what he specifically says is I will go to the child, but the child will never come back to me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that's, and Oh, and then him and Bathsheba get pregnant again and have another son and then name him drum roll, please Solomon, K- oh. AKA King Solomon of Israel. I thought it was going to be Uriah as like a, you know, Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about your lamb. No, no. I think I think David probably wants to put that out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> but God's like, I remember. I remember. Solomon. Solomon, who will be, you know, Solomon the Wise, who. Um, I have no idea. Who oh, you don't know? Oh, him. okay. Um, yeah, he does. A, he's a very he's he's very interesting. He's he's arguably people call him the wisest man of oh. the Bible because he like specifically asked God for wisdom and nothing else, and God was like, cool here you go and he was known as a very wise ruler um he's the guy who wrote the book of ecclesiastes which is like pre pre pessimism and nihilism like existentialism it's like yeah like all he's the one who came to he's like the richest man in the world and one of the wisest and he comes to the conclusion that nothing nothing matters oh good (laughs) yeah so that's nice anyway so that's the story of david and bathsheba that's really interesting so um this is all kind of just told from David's perspective. Um, oh, no, it's like a third person because he didn't write this book. Like a third person narrative? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I actually don't know who wrote this book. Oh. So. That would be interesting to know. Yeah, I should find out. Who um, wrote it? It was probably just one of the many, many scribes because that was a big job back then. If you could read and write, you were working for the royalty. So is this just like, you know, like, you're a school and you're a student in history class and you learn the story or like how did this person who know who wrote it how did how did how would they know this story um you know it probably because after it happened i would assume david based on david's character like in other parts of the bible i would be very surprised if he did not tell people about this mm. he was a uh, he was a very you know, he wasn't perfect. He was obviously very flawed. He killed a man for his wife. Um, but he, at the same time, was a very, a very, like, virtuous man in terms of just, like, you know, like, b- being very honest. You know, mm-hmm. he was not a, he was not a, he was not a bad king. Devious. He was not devious. That's the right word. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, but on a lighter note, King George and the Ducky. Unless... Wait, first. Oh, okay, sorry. What are you um... talk <laughs> How is this like in your home church setting as you read this? What was, how was this kind of, pre- I, I don't know if presented as, to you as a kid, but like what kind of lessons were do you think you were supposed to pull from this? Um, well, for I, as with a lot of the stories about the Old Testament, quote unquote, heroes or people, um, a lot of it is just basically that even the people that God chooses are not perfect, perfect. and mm-hmm. that everyone like our, our position before God is not dependent on what we've done in our life. Mm-hmm. It's essentially like, um, you know, we, it, there's a, there's a difference between our eternal standing with God and the con like the events of this life, which is like the separation between free will and determinism that was like our eternal position is determined but this life at the same time is like full of choices that we must make and Mm -hmm. you know but it doesn't affect at least i believe personally that it doesn't affect where we go Mm -hmm. at the end right yeah um interesting and so i i what about bathsheba and all of this like do we ever understand her Role, not like not necessarily her role, but her thoughts on her role in this, and like her willingness to be a part. Is she just someone that is shuffled along at the whim of King David? That's a very good question. I I think I know that of all of David's wives, I'm pretty sure Bathsheba is the one he loved the most, 
and him him and Bathsheba, if I remember correctly, I might be remembering this very wrong, but him and Bathsheba were like Is it like a love at first sight kind of thing? It might have been. Like they were really close. Um because like I said, if I remember correctly, during like Absalom's rebellion, I'm pretty sure Bathsheba was one of the wives that went with David mm-hmm. when David had to go into hiding. Mm-hmm. Um and so and there might be some extra biblical stuff about that. Like I said, I read that article about the nine men in the life of Bathsheba. Um, and I, I, yeah, I'd have to do more reading on that. Are, are there any that you can think of stories in the Bible where the women are centered? Yes. Um, well, off the top of my head, Esther. Okay. Esther is a... need to learn about her now. I'm just yeah. like wondering like... Are the women always going to be this, like, secondary character? No, not always. Okay. No, no, no. That's good. That um, gives... I'm more interested to learn more about the Bible then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? No. It, 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 Otherwise, boring. Yeah, right. Boys I know. Boring. It's true. Yeah, no, very true. I know, because, like... And, and which is actually very surprising, because as, as we both know, especially ancient Israelite religion was extremely patriarchal. Mm-hmm. But... So even in a, a, a document that comes from an extremely patriarchal culture... Like, yeah, no, there were, um, it, even, um, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, Sarah had quite a bit of autonomy and say about things that were happening as did, uh, Hagar, her servant. I don't necessarily mean, do they have autonomy in their stories, but is the story, like, I know this story is not told from King David's perspective. It's to- it's told by a scribe, like a third person, mm-hmm. but it follows him you know we know that he saw Bathsheba and he oh loved I see her, but we don't know how she felt yes yeah we don't know how she felt so that's kind of what I mean by centered is are we even if it's not being told by her are we seeing it you know more or less from her perspective I see yeah um and, well and yeah and, and Esther again off the top of my head Esther and um uh and others like there are many instances in the Bible where it does give the woman's perspective on what's happening that's awesome yeah so yeah yeah can't wait to hear some of yeah (laughs) um uh mary mary mother of jesus Ah, yeah that there's a lot that she had quite a few feelings about what was happening i would bet yeah right uh and then there's the whole labor pain being one of them oh my gosh um (laughs) 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 i love you so much did you turn southern there oh Oh, my my gosh gosh. because my mom's southern that's true that's true (laughs) even though she doesn't really have an accent you didn't live there at all. no i didn't live there at all um but king george and the ducky Yes. So, <laughs> to the in, most important, the part, most of important the part of this episode, because I completely forgot about it until we started doing this episode. So, in the story of King George and the Ducky, King George is uh, at home during the Great Pie War, where people throw pies at each other all day. Mm-hmm. And um, he looks down and sees somebody taking a bath, but he sees the rubber ducky. And he has a collection of hundreds of rubber There's duckies. There's a person in the bath. But he notices the rubber ducky. Exactly. Okay. Um, Why do people bathe with rubber duckies? Why is that a thing? I have no idea. That's a good question. All right. It's very strange. Um, yeah, so he notices the rubber ducky. <laughs> I just picture this, like, someone's bathing, uh, and then the camera just, like, zooms in really close That's on this, you know, rubber ducky. exactly what happens. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly how it is. <laughs> Ooh. And, like, and the person bathing is singing a little song to their, because they've got, they're the poor person, they've only got one little rubber ducky. Aww. And King George they has. They love this rubber they ducky. They love that rubber ducky. And King George has, like. It's the lamb. Exactly, yeah. And King George has like closets Wait, does full of them. Does that mean that the person bathing would be Uriah? Oh, yeah. In this situation, that's correct. Kinky. Yeah. Very kinky. This okay. is Veggie Tales is very kinky. Um and so then he has Is King George like celery? Like what is he? Oh, he's he's Larry the Cucumber. Anyone who's seen Veggie Tales will know what I'm talking about. King David is King George Larry the Cucumber. Played by Larry the Cucumber. Oh, okay. I get it. Oh, so they're like play actors. Exactly. Characters. Yeah, okay. all the characters play different when they ever because they have like the it's like the 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 plot structure of every VeggieTales episode is the vegetables are on a counter talking to us. Like it's like they're the hosts of the TV show. Ah. And then it goes to like Storyland where they're all playing the different characters from the story. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, it's, so King George spies the rubber ducky and says love it must need, have it must have that rubber ducky and so um does yeah. it look like all the other rubber duckies? exactly yeah it does uh, and so he and so <laughs> which is not which is not a nice in like it, you don't want to dig too deep into that one with like you know 
<laughs> but um, so he has he has the kid sent off to battle. Oh, it's a kid, by the way, bathing. With, I just re- realized that it, that makes it so so much, so much worse. worse. Has the kid sent off to battle. Pie battle. Uh, to the pie battle. Doesn't get killed because this is a children's show. But he does return and he is like, you know, shell-shocked with pie. Oh, <laughs> Covered no. Covered in like raspberry pie. <laughs> and he's like having flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. He's having pie war flashbacks. Oh, no. And, and then he, um, and then like King George is like, okay, we're going to take care of him. Like, you know, so he like, you know like cleans him up and like you know as his recovery process he gets his rubber ducky back so it has like a kind of a different ending he gives the rubber ducky back to the kid uh after getting told the exact same story because nathan the prophet is still nathan the prophet in this story okay so it's more of a learning story than a you know consequences story exactly yeah okay so there's an arc for <laughs> King George in this one. Yes, he and he and he redeems himself, and it's essentially don't don't be jealous of your neighbor's things. Mm. That's that's the moral of the story. Use them, abuse them, and give them back. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, VeggieTales. <laughs> uh, well, that was really interesting, and I've never ever heard of David and Bathsheba before. Um, is this? I mean. I don't know. I don't know, like, the big, you know, the big names, basically. But is this a well-known story? Yeah, this is a pretty well-known story. Um, it's pretty salacious. It's very salacious. Oh, and it's, yeah, it's very salacious. Wait till we get to, like, Samson and Delilah. Oh, I know about that one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but, yeah, this one, they actually made a movie about this one. I just re- refined out recently. I think it's from 1951 with mm-hmm. Gregory Peck. Ooh. I haven't seen it. It's probably terrible. Oh. I mean, I love Gregory Peck, but the Bible movies from that time were terrible. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> yes. But maybe not. Maybe it's great. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Well, this was great. This was great. Uh, I guess we're done. I guess we're done. How we're do we... We're going to have to learn how to sign off. We are going to have to learn how to sign off. <laughs> da, 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 no, stop da, da. it. Okay. Just hit the stop, <laughs> button. stop button. Thank you for listening. For podcast updates and more blasphemous content, check out our Patreon by searching Blasphemous Sod